Yes, your grace. How would you score your government? Part 1. Gracefully done. Yes, your grace is a wonderful new title from indie development team Brave at Night. You play as King Eric, the troubled ruler of the Kingdom of Davern. Week to week, you split your time caring for the military needs of the kingdom, the material needs of your subjects, and the emotional needs of your family. During the course of gameplay, I was completely suckered into the little world of Davern. I grew to love Eric's family and internalized his weariness with the bullshit of statecraft. I was so overcome with the nail-biting tension of making the right choices that I marathoned my first playthrough of the game over the course of a single day. This game made me feel things. It made me struggle with the moral weight of political leadership, it popped some interesting thoughts into my head about our current political leaders, the art charmed me, the music caught my ears, the humor made me chuckle. I'd gladly recommend it. It's well worth the price of entry. I wanted to say that up front because unlike a traditional review, I'd like to take this discussion a step further from buy or pass. Because the part of the game that left the strongest impression on me was its scoring system. It differs radically from traditional kingdom management games like Civ, Crusader Kings, Europa Universalis. They score you as win or lose, and don't condemn you for being a bloody tyrant. They only rate your efficiency on a grand scale. Yes, Your Grace is a much smaller and more focused game in scope, to the point of being its own genre and totally incomparable. In regards to its ending, this game scored me much more intimately. My successes were judged based on who I failed to defend, which of my citizens I let down, which of my daughters I'd failed to raise. I was graded on a curve of human suffering. That scoring system left a much more profound impact on me than I expected and invited me to think about how I'd score my contemporary government. That's one of the most unique experiences I've had with a fantasy video game, so I wanted to chat about it. Part 2. Don't be a spoil sport. I will be discussing the gameplay mechanics of Yes Your Grace and the score they generate. I will not spoil the story aspects of the game's ending. I will not tell you who survives, what falls apart, who falls in love, how to play, or where the hidden immunity idol is located. There are, give or take technicalities, eight axes that you can land a bad, neutral, or good ending for. I won't even divulge what these axes are for spoilers' sake. Side note, I did have to look up the plural for the word axis, and I was indeed surprised that axes is grammatically correct. English is silly. At the end of the game, you receive a slideshow epilogue that ties your actions and policies in equal parts to the stability of your kingdom and the emotional health of the people that surround you. I appreciated that the game didn't just ask if you kept your kingdom in order, it stated how your citizens, refugees, political enemies, and family feel about your rule. Part 3. Initial Confusions On my first run of the game, I managed five good ending slides, two neutral slides, one bad slide. And I thought, damn, that was tight, but I did great. And mistakenly, I had thought that this was about as good of an ending one could conceivably achieve in the game. A lot of the choices you make during gameplay revolve around the distribution of limited resources, and I had spent every last dime and sack of grain. I hadn't hoarded. When I said no to peasants, soldiers, dukes, or relatives, it was because I had nothing left to give. This was a game about sacrifice with no clear solutions. I think that, at least partially, the game's marketing mistakenly led me to this narrative. Here's a few quotes from the game's storefront. In this kingdom management RPG, petitioners will arrive in the throne room each turn to ask for your advice and assistance. Decide whether to help them with their problems or to conserve resources for more important matters. Remember, supplies are limited and not everyone has the kingdom's best interests at heart. These are troubling times, Your Grace. The petitioner's petty matters exceed our limited resources to say nothing of the war. A careful balance must be struck. Your throne awaits. Villagers will ask for your help with various problems, from monsters attacking the village to a lack of place to relax and enjoy themselves. Some will bring humor to your throne room and some will present you with difficult choices. Your family is important too, and throughout your time as king, you will have to support them in their struggles. You will face lords with a variety of personalities. You will need their support in order to win an upcoming battle, but some may ask you to perform dirty deeds to cement alliances. One thing is clear, it won't be easy to keep everyone happy. I had taken this to mean that at no point in the game could you achieve a perfect ending, with 8 out of 8 slides being in the firm positive. I assumed the game's core mechanics revolved around making moral choices. Who is more important, my wife who I love, or the citizens who I tax? 
what's more vital, appeasing the lords who empower me or empowering my daughters to make their own choices? So on, so forth. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay also led to this misunderstanding. Some of the conflicts you resolve really do revolve around moral judgments. For example, I had the option to facilitate and participate in the sale of narcotics. Different characters even warned me on the negatives and positives of doing so. As a person outside the game, I'm a strong believer in decriminalization. The war on drugs is probably the easiest thing I can point to as an example of catastrophic failure in government policy. So I made what I thought was the moral choice. I financed my war effort by allowing drugs into my kingdom. And there were consequences for doing so. Much like in real life, Yes Your Grace portrayed addiction as the result of drugs being available. Some of my citizens paid the price for my moral stance on the issue. Now in real life, I support decriminalization acting in conjunction with the availability of modern medicine. In the 21st century, we could also encourage and finance scientists, sociologists, doctors, and policy experts to assist with battling addiction. As medieval King Eric, unfortunately, I didn't have the tools to react to an addiction pandemic. And this was simply a low-level early game decision. There were far tougher ones. The threat of impending war brought up one of the toughest choices I've made in video games myself. By marrying my daughters to powerful nobles, I could secure military alliances that would more than triple the size of my defending forces. I wasn't doing this to expand or colonize or invade. This was the matter of saving the lives of my citizens from incoming invasion. Part 4. Paying the Price In my previous video essay about Fire Emblem, I made my feelings on nobility, the privileges of aristocracy, and the institution of peerage pretty clear. I hate him with a passion. I don't like how often fantasy protagonists come from royal blood to start with, or, surprise twist, were secretly the long-lost prince all along. I like stories about people who choose to do the right thing, not stories about people who do the right thing because an accident of birth decided their fate beforehand. My obnoxious hardline stance in tow, I approached the game with the following philosophy. King Eric's wife and daughters would be my last priority. I wouldn't be a nepotistic shit and prioritize the safety and happiness of my children over the many children whose lives I held in my royal hands. My daughters were lucky enough to grow up filthy rich. I wouldn't give them an inch more. Short of allowing Sidani to keep her pets, which cost me no resources, I ignored their needs. And I'll admit, this was difficult. I got to enjoy the company of the queen and the princesses. They're well-written, lovely characters less dazzling than the royals of GOT's Season 1-4, through four, but way better than the dumpster fire of how those same characters were written in Seasons 5-8. through eight. Yes Your Grace's characters are solidly written, especially given the tight amount of lines allotted to each. So I felt pretty bad about consistently marrying my daughters to secure military alliances. But damn me, they'd still be living in the lap of luxury as queens abroad, right? Right. Ugh, gosh. How do I justify that? Is ensuring the safety of thousands worth treating my children like cattle, especially in such a blatantly sexist manner? These were characters I'd grown close to, and this was marriage in the transactional, misogynist, oppressive, and harrowing medieval sense. I was selling their freedom, their future, their reproductive autonomy. This was a grossly immoral thing to do. But on that first playthrough, I didn't regret the choice. I had thousands of lives to save. Citizens first, refugees second, soldiers fourth, Lord's fifth, family last. That's how I got the 5-2-1. And I felt proud. I had made sacrifices to do right by the people who trusted me to govern, and I'd done it in an impartial way. I had navigated the moral landscape with ethics in mind. This was the balance I'd struck. What a hell of a game, making me feel dirty and proud, sinful and justified. Having loved the game, I decided to play a second campaign and see if I could eke out a better score than 5 good, 2 neutral, 1 bad. I was curious if foresight and prior knowledge can bump me up to a score like 5-3-2 or 6-0-2, maybe 6-2-0 if I really knocked it out of the park. But I was always convinced that part of the game would include choosing to deliberately let someone down. I was curious about different balancing of the scale. I started my second playthrough, and unfortunately, that was a bit of a disaster. Part 5. Second Time's the Charm On a second playthrough, I slowly realized that giving my family what they wanted could still be achieved while balancing my ledgers. With the power of foresight and previous knowledge, 
I knew not to dump resources into specific bad faith petitioners. Liars, thieves, and riffraff bards got tossed right out of my court. And on paying closer attention the second time around, the game even went as far as to provide clues as to who was lying and not worth the effort. If I'd been more attentive, I maybe, maybe could have sussed out the optimal choices my first go. With the liars and cheats going empty-handed, I found out I had the resources to resolve all crises, so I doted on my wife and children, managed to make selfish decisions on their behalf, while still ruling the kingdom like an A-plus tyrant with a heart of gold. That's the biggest spoiler I'll give you. With some spare room for minor error, you could do what I did. You could land a perfect 8-0-0. Part 6. The Misery of Doing Everything Right and in doing that, I'd invalidated the struggle of my first playthrough. There's no meaningful sacrifice or balance to be struck in Yes, Your Grace. You can have your cake and eat it too. There is a correct set of decisions to make, meaning everything that really resonated with me about the scoring system turned sour. This game had gotten me to consider moral dilemmas and then pulled the rug out from underneath me. To be a proper moral dilemma, the problem at hand needs to have no perfect solution. In each case, the decision maker should have moral reasons to do each of two actions, when doing both actions at the same time is impossible. The dilemma is picking which of the exclusive answers you personally would pick and why. I loved Yes Your Grace because I mistakenly thought it was a trolley problem intricate and personal enough to challenge my feelings and test my resolves, a dilemma that stopped being so abstract and hypothetical. I had to choose, over and over again, what I believed was the right thing to do and face the music for it. Watch someone rejoice and someone suffer. That's not the developer's fault. None of their advertising is malicious or wrong. I would characterize this as an honest miscommunication between both parties. I was excited about moral dilemmas, which were never an express point of the game. So having completed the second run-through, I'm left kind of stuck. Do I actually like this game? That question led me down another rabbit hole, how this game made me feel about real-life politics. Part 6b. The Rabbit Hole of Real Politics I corded off this section of the video because I'm going to talk about real, modern-day problems. That's not a comfortable subject for some people. These days are tough, and maybe you don't want to devote more time to divisive issues. You've got 39 seasons of Survivor to catch up on, and you always promised yourself you'd read Dostoyevsky when you finally had the time. Screw politics. I get it. So I'll leave you with my conclusion up front. I do actually really like this game, and I still recommend you play it. Go have fun and leave the politics stone unturned. Otherwise, this game is literally about overseeing a nation. The core gameplay loop is creating politics, and you are scored about how you wield political power. That's why I'm chatting politics. Beyond miscommunication, I initially despised the perfect ending because I felt it was too unreal. Saccharin and cinnamony and not my flavor. Reality doesn't quite function like that. There's no 8-0-0 ending in any country's history. Not just because history doesn't end, like a video game would, but also because the world kind of sucks. You mention any civilization's golden age, and some historian will pop out of their burrow and describe how three generations later said society collapsed. If the historian sees their own shadow, you're also doomed to six more weeks of winter, so watch out. But relating the kingdom management of the game to real-world history also made me question my modern-day kingdom managers. 5-2-1 initially felt like a massive achievement to me personally, but I'd also want my government to perform better than a... Quick maths, like 75% success rate? I expect better than a solid C from professionals and experts. I was playing a game, politicians are handling real life. Why would I be salty about the game letting me score higher than a 6-2-0 when that's the literal bare minimum I'd want from my actual politicians? That's what I demand from my leadership, even in the real world, where that's significantly harder to deliver. And, oh boy, are they failing to deliver. Like many others in the United States, I'm currently on unpaid furlough. I'm lucky enough that when this ends, I have a job to go back to. I'm physically safe and incredibly fortunate. But in the meantime, it took me three weeks of checking in daily with the IRS to be able to give them my banking information so I could get the April stimulus money. 
I checked the box to indicate I'd prefer direct deposit, and then the website told me I'd receive it by mail a full week after rent was due. Dealing with state unemployment benefits has been far worse. I paid my taxes and earned my benefits. I received a determination in my favor, and have certified for six weeks so far. All that money is tied up in an unknown, non-monetary issue. I've called daily, logged into the chat service daily, emailed to call my state representative and governor, no one has answered. The only time I received a clue as to what's keeping my status in limbo was a Reddit post that directed me to a state treasurer's Twitter account that directed me to a YouTube video from the director of unemployment recorded by him personally with a webcam at home explaining my specific holdup. None of this information was linked on the native unemployment site. And unfortunately, the YouTube video's answer was, here's what's going on, wait until you can get a hold of a person on the phone. So I was still back to square one. And this is just the stuff directly affecting me. There's much bigger issues. My state has the highest death rate for corona, with the majority of hospitalizations being poor and minority individuals who were deemed essential. These victims were forced to work at the highest risk for the state minimum pay. In a triple combo of stupidity, malice, and deliberate underfunding, my local government is throwing its own citizens under the bus along a class and race vector that's literally dystopian. To make it even worse, the head of the federal government is beefing with my governor on Twitter, and essential supplies, testing kits, and medical equipment is being held up in profit schemes and red tape. The victims of this crisis won't see proper treatment anytime soon. So from the personal, to the local, to the state, to the federal, it's failure all the way up and down. Deliberate failure. People, especially minorities, are dying as a result. If I scored my leadership like Yes Your Grace scored me, I wouldn't give this vile government anything higher than a 0-0-8. Part 7. Back to King Eric's Halls. But what does all of that have to do with Yes Your Grace? Running the game's ending over and over in my head, I held up for a second. An 8-0-0 is unrealistic. It's not just unlikely, but probably impossible. Still, I clearly went into a second playthrough thinking that I could hit 6-2-0, before I understood that moral dilemmas, where you could achieve some moral good at the expense of failing another, weren't a part of the game's scoring system. My core expectation as a person, it seems, is that even in the presence of tough and unfair choices, it is possible to achieve a B+. It seems I also instinctively felt that it's necessary to try again until you do. And I'm amazed and appreciative that Yes Your Grace led me to consider and confirm that belief. No video game has linked itself to me in this specific way before. Past that, if you don't mind sticking around a few minutes more, my second playthrough of Yes Your Grace took place on May Day. May 1st, also known as International Workers' Day, is an international holiday celebrating and promoting the rights of the working class. Since 1904, May Day has been marked with protests and political activism. Among other achievements, the May Day demonstrations won us the eight-hour workday. In a similar coincidence, I sat down and wrote this essay on May 4th. As well as being Star Wars Day, this is the 50th anniversary of student protests against Nixon and his attempts to expand the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Both of these occasions are stark reminders that voting once every four years has never been and will never be enough. If I want a 6-2-0, I should act on it. I should encourage others to act on it, and it will not be easy. May Day also commemorates the victims of the Haymarket bombing and the ensuing police massacre. Eight workers' rights advocates were unjustly sentenced by a stacked jury, and May Day exists to carry on their memories as well. Samuel Fielden, Louis Ling, George Engel, Adolf Fischer, Michael Schwab, Albert Parsons, and August Spies were all unfairly sentenced to death by hanging, with Oscar and Ebel sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. All because they had the courage to campaign for the health and safety of their fellow workers. Their trial is considered by all contemporary historians to be an unjust sham. The government murdered them for daring to advocate for a better world. In a similar tragic fashion, May 4th protests resulted in the Kent State Massacre, where members of the National Guard opened fire on fleeing students. Protesters Jeffrey Glenn Miller and Alison Krauss were murdered. Passerby William Knox Schroeder and Sandra Lee Schuer, 
who were not protesting were murdered as well. Nine other students were wounded, with one suffering permanent paralysis. Protesting, agitating, organizing, unionizing, and building a better world are a matter of blood, sweat, and tears. But it's worked in the past, and it will work again in the future. There's a 6-2-0 out there if we fight for it. I want to be clear, this isn't about me deliberately endangering my own life or asking others to martyr themselves. This isn't a call for bloody valor. But I recognize the sacrifices that were made on our behalf, and I think we should pay it forward by working hard to leave this world a better place for others in the future. Part 8. Wrapping it up. Boy oh boy, did I drift. I swore to myself this script would clock in at sub 3,000 words, and here I am literally one word shy of 4,000. It's probably more than that in the recording because I can't read off a teleprompter to save my goddamn life. If my public speaking professor heard the raw version of this audio, she would demand my university take back my diploma. And that's why I want to give Yes Your Grace as much praise as I can. I can't stop thinking or talking about it. Reviews are a subjective measure of quality wherein the critic attempts to describe the intensity of impact, positive or negative, that a piece of art has had on them. Obviously, my subjective experience of this game was deeply colored by the surrounding circumstances of the week and a half I spent with it. I'm not confident it's fair of me to tie the game so closely to personal and historical circumstances that are so far out of the developer's controls or intended play experience. But I'm choosing to do so, because that's generally how other critics measure mediums like film, literature, poetry, painting. No one would discuss American Gothic strictly on the merits of brushstrokes ignoring its historic and cultural influences. We talk about it because of how well it encapsulates 20th century Americana and how many times it's been referenced or parodied. Art lives or dies by context. As my parents would tell you, I play too many video games. This is not my first rodeo, but this is the first time a video game as a piece of art has tied itself to my life in such a unique way. By scoring my statescraft, through the measurement of human suffering, this game made me reflect in a way Civ, Crusader Kings, and Age of Empires never has. Yes, Your Grace managed to feel much more personal, much more distressing. Somehow, much more hopeful too. And maybe, just maybe, I have to admit that the perfect ending does put a smile on my face, especially because I don't personally hope to ever experience an 8-0-0 in real life. That sequence of epilogues is like eating a cinnamon roll. Broccoli is far better for me, but damn if I'm not going to disobey doctor's orders once in a blue moon. I'll be sneaking off to make a midnight snack of Yes Your Grace 2 the moment Brave at Night releases it. Even if I would have tweaked the recipe for personal taste, this dev team knows how to bake something special. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. I've got scripts in the making for Robin Hood, D&D, The Trader Bar of Cormorant, so there's plenty more coming up soon on top of previously published essays on Fire Emblem Three Houses and The Witcher books for you to check out straight away. I also write and produce my own fantasy audio novellas if that's your kind of thing. Part 9. Good God, are we finally wrapped up? Like a burrito ready for takeout, we are. See you next time.